Welcome everyone to today's UMTRC webinar. Today we're going to hear from Visuel, from Michael and John. And uh, just to remind you, we are recording today's session. This, the recording will be on our YouTube page and we will also put the slides in a PDF format on our website under our archived webinars. So without further ado, gentlemen, take it away. Thank you so much, Becky. It is a pleasure to be with you all. Uh, I'm John Elder, and my colleague Michael O'Neill here is with me uh, as well. And, and we're excited to be here today because we are, we're with Visual. We're a telemedicine platform provider, and I think today's topic obviously is very timely for a lot of you all as you're trying to figure out how do we navigate COVID-19? Uh, you know, what's the future look like? Man, these last seven, eight months have been a blur, a little bit of a whirlwind. What's the future look like for us? And we really want to lay out for you all uh, a clear path of kind of where we are, why telemedicine is important, and, and where we're going in the future. To give you a little bit of a, of a background on us and, and who we are, we've been in this space for uh, about a decade now. We, we launched in 2011 doing these custom configured platforms. And, and in that time, we have done over three and a half million uh, remote visits, virtual visits for folks. We started out in the behavioral space. We have then since branched out and launched into working with hospitals and health systems. And in that time, we have found over 25, almost 30 different use cases, different workflows. A lot of you may be doing, you know, urgent care, ambulatory things, uh, uh, use, use cases, but we've, we've found, you know, 23 to 28 other use cases on top of that that are currently being implemented with hospitals and health systems all across the country. And, and all of those include inpatient, outpatient, and asynchronous visits. A lot of you are doing synchronous, some are, are focusing on asynchronous, synchronous, but that both, uh, including in and outpatient, are all very, very important. And of course, at the end of the day, it's crucial that your platform is HIPAA compliant. Everything we do is HIPAA compliant. Uh, we know uh, there are some platforms out there that are not, but as we move forward, those were good as a stopgap. But as we move forward, it's very important that your platform become uh, is HIPAA compliant and that everything gets hosted on a secure cloud server. So some things to keep in mind, just of kind of who we are, where we've been and, and where we're going as we talk through today's presentation. Yeah, thanks so much, John. And, and really, really great to be with you all here today. Um, you know, the first thing I wanna talk about here are, are some proven telehealth ROI streams. Um, I think it's, it's no secret right now that obviously telemedicine is, is very popular, uh, but also kind of on the flip side of things, it's, it's actually very simple right now. There's, there's really one primary use case that most organizations are deploying, which is taking care of their ambulatory outpatient visits virtually. Um, so there are a lot of other areas and opportunity for increased ROI in those other 25 to 30 different styles of telemedicine, uh, which we're going to focus on here in the next few minutes. Uh, some of those uh, options or uh, abilities for you to increase your ROI on your platform uh, range from program startup funds all the way down to end user and community value. Uh, program startup funds, uh, of course, very, very apparent right now. We're seeing a lot of organizations plan at the moment for the future. They're planning for next year, of course, but even three, five, ten years down the line, where do they want to be virtually and how much is that going to cost? And getting those programs funded to an extent, of course, is um, actually pretty um, effective right now with the amount of funding available from, for example, the FCC, uh, HRSA, USDA, and so being able to kind of prime the pump uh, with budget allocations, grants, even making other partnerships with organizations can really, really help you kickstart your program kind of um, past what you're doing today and start expanding into all of those other innovative areas of telemedicine, which we're going to be focusing on primarily today. Uh, and those other areas start bringing a lot of patient value to the table as well. Of course, this is very, very apparent right now. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're sure of this because telehealth is 
increasing in utilization and, and people are enjoying it. And so, you know, if volumes were decreasing or plummeted back down, we'd know that, oh, you know, maybe this isn't as viable as we thought, uh, but people are enjoying this. And so we understand that the patient value is real here and things like missed work days and reduced travel time and just overall convenience as well. Then there's also physician value to bring to the table as well. Um, some of those go hand in hand with the patient value as far as convenience and time savings. Uh, but really right now, a huge aspect of physician value is limiting exposure. Um, for example, we have some customers actually that are placing telemedicine carbs inside of their inpatient rooms and they're doing the providers are doing their rounds from the hallway and they're just kind of patching into that room virtually so they don't have to go and you know gown up and put full PPE on just for a, a, you know easy assessment right and so limiting exposure not only for the physicians but also for your community are two really really valuable areas of virtual care not only in the ambulatory outpatient setting right now but also as you start expanding out into other areas of telemedicines like specialist referral and on-demand urgent care and things of that nature. Uh, community value is largely um, influenced by simply taking better care of the population, making healthcare more available. And then of course, right now, limiting exposure, keeping your COVID numbers down and hopefully um, someday soon, reopening our communities to, to full capacity. Reimbursement revenue, that's, that's a tricky one right now, to be honest. You know, we're in a very, very unprecedented time as far as reimbursement goes, as far as, you know, I'm sure many of you know. Uh, reimbursement has never been this open, and we're not sure what it's, what's going to happen to it post-COVID. Um, we're very, very confident that it's going to stay much better than it was, right? Uh, but I think our payers will start coming back and saying, well, we're not going to reimburse for phone visits anymore. You need to have a video component, or we're not going to reimburse for visits done on a non-HIPAA compliant platform, which they've already said. So I think a lot of those things will kind of start getting drawn back, uh, but we're very, very confident that reimbursement is going to stay in the favor of the healthcare organizations post COVID simply because I don't think it's possible for a payer to say, sorry, we're just not gonna reimburse for virtual care anymore when it's as popular as it is now. Uh, and then other areas where you can gain additional reimbursement revenue, you know, pending it stays open, um, adding market share to other areas, um, maybe even charging originating site fees if you're hosting patients for specialist visits uh, filling available care slots if you're underutilized. And I don't think it's any secret that telemedicine and telehealth can actually provide better health care to certain patient populations, which really, really helps to influence positive ROI as well. Keeping that cost of health care down, keeping people out of the emergency rooms, reducing readmissions um, now in today's you know, world, just really taking better care of people um, is really much easier to do when you have uh, the technology to increase the access to care. So those are a few of you know, some proven ROI streams that we've seen you know, over the past nine years or so. Um, obviously that's easy to say, right? So we wanna kind of give you some ideas and some examples of uh, what we have deployed with some of our customers that help allow you to take advantage of all of those ROI streams. Uh, and here are some proven telemedicine use cases that are very, very beneficial. Um, you know, these are really in an, an effort to kind of maybe get some wheels turning in your head and think, oh yeah, that one applies to me. Maybe we should start looking into it. Um, one of the first ones here is load balancing. So this is particularly beneficial to a multi-location organization that might have a busy site and a really slow site. And you might be moving providers around back and forth between those sites based on the volume. And so being able to balance those loads virtually saves a lot of costs and helps um, decrease you know, wait times and things like that as well. So load balancing is a pretty popular one. Of course, Telestroke is the longest standing form of virtual care. So that by default is the most proven. Uh, you also have neonatology as well. Um, this one if, is very, very popular in rural areas where there might not be a neonatologist within maybe an hour or two hours. And so being able to import that provider into a rural facility 
virtually when it's appropriate, of course, is very, very beneficial to bring that high level specialty care into those underserved uh, areas and populations. The school nurse support, this is a really, really fun project to work with and to work on with a lot of our customers. Uh, I will say that in our experience, these types of programs uh, tend to get funding from USDA because it's surrounded around learning. Uh, so if you have a school nurse program on your horizon, we would encourage you to apply for a DLT grant because you might have a good shot. Uh, but a school nurse program is really where you equip uh, your school nurses, of course, with uh, the schools that you're partnering with in your area with an array of clinical devices, especially in these rural areas where oftentimes they're lower income as well. This is really, really helpful because mom and dad might be working multiple jobs, can't afford to take time off work. And in those cases, sometimes the best place for a child to get health care is while they're at school. So it's a really, really uh, heartwarming program to work on. And it really benefits schools as well, too, because the quicker that we can get that patient treated, the quicker they get better, the quicker they get back to school and the less absentee days the school has, which, of course, is how they're funded. Uh, so they'll get more money next year because they're doing a better job with your health. Direct to consumer low acuity visits. Of course, that's what everyone's doing right now. And then you have your chronic care management and remote patient monitoring for, uh, for example, maybe your diabetic population. So those are some popular ones as well that involve devices that go in the patient's home and things of that nature. But there's some other ones that I'll pop up on the screen here so you guys can at least see them. Um, but one that I will spend a little bit more time, time on here is speaking about an emergency room, emergency department referral use case. Again, one that's very, very popular and innovative for these rural areas. There's really two ends of the spectrum here, right? You've got the extreme end where you're importing high level specialty care into the emergency room. So for example, patient comes into the emergency room with a stroke. The only other option, if you don't have a neurologist on staff is to transfer them to somewhere that has a neurologist, right? Um, but being able to patch that high level specialty care in virtually in this example gets that patient seen quicker, of course, uh, which we know in stroke, you know, minutes or brain cells. And so that's one example kind of on the high level uh, extreme end, but you also have the lower ends with low acuity visits and the lack of after hours healthcare availability in some of these rural areas. And so a lot of our hospitals that we work with in very rural areas suffer from increased ER utilization after hours because there's simply nowhere else for people to go in a case that very well could have been treated maybe at an urgent care facility is now generating a you know $800 ER bill, right? And taking up one of the hospital's emergency room beds. And so uh, one solution to that is to have a nurse practitioner or maybe a you know, primary care provider on call, maybe claiming visits from home in some cases, and you're able to get those patients treated quicker and you're able to also get them home quicker as well and free up those emergency room beds for when those extreme cases do come in and you need them. So John's going to talk a little bit here about what that telestroke workflow looks like as an example um, here next. Yeah, so obviously first things first, in, in this example of somebody's having a stroke, they come into the ER and in this example in a rural area where there may not be a neurologist on staff and the ER doctor, the medical assistant, the nurse, whoever's uh, initially uh, assessing that patient realizes, hey, we need a specialist here. So they're gonna take that patient into the room, wheel the medical cart in, point it directly at the patient, and then choose the waiting room in which they need to be placed. In this example, we need a neurologist. So they're gonna be put into a waiting room where there's a pool of neurologists on call. And the first available provider is able to claim that visit and connect with that patient and that medical assistant or that ER physician uh, at, the, at the distant location. The, the neurologist can then access the camera 
uh, maybe zoom in to the patient on, uh, try to see some facial drooping, try to determine is this ischemic, is this hemorrhagic, what, what type of stroke are we dealing with? Uh, are we gonna be able to, to administer TPA? Does, is this a, a case where they need to be taken to a hospital uh, for a, a, another hospital for surgery, something like that? What type of scenario are we dealing with? They can pan over, they can look at the medical chart, they can zoom in on vitals, things like that. Uh, but they're all going to be connected into the same visit with the neurologist, the patient, and the, the attending physician or, or medical assistant all in the same room together. And as a, as a group, as a team, those folks are going to be able to, to determine the best route to, to take this patient through the and through the process, get them the care that they need. As Michael said, minutes are equal to brain cells in this example. So time is of the essence, and this is a high priority case that uh, we can't afford to delay. We can't afford to waste time. We're going to be able to document everything that happens in the EHR or the EMR. We're going to do that so as to not disrupt the billing cycle and make sure everything gets funneled where it needs to be. But time is of the essence here. So yes, you have some low acuity use cases that, that may happen, but you also have these very, uh, uh, very high demand, very, again, time is of the essence type patients and type appointments that if you're in a rural area, you don't have a neurologist on staff, you need to get to one and in front of one, have this patient in front of one ASAP. Now, in addition to medical carts and things like that, I talked about the cart being wheeled up to the, to the base of the bed. It's, it's vital in our opinion. It's of the utmost importance that you have a platform that can integrate with medical devices. Um, we have relationships with folks like JedMed with their, their horoscope. They have about six, seven, eight different lenses that can attach to that, the Littman stethoscope. Some of you, I'm sure, have some old Cisco machines or polycom cameras uh, laying around. Is your platform able to dial into those, do a SIP uh, dial-in? Uh, and, and for a lot of you, those, are, those old machines are nothing, I say old, they're only probably a few years old, but for a lot of you, they're nothing more than really expensive doorstops at this point find a platform that can resurrect the, the, all that legacy technology, the tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars that you've already invested in that. Let's resurrect those machines and put them to use. Pan tilt zoom cameras with, with polycom, Cisco, things like that. Let's get, let's blow the dust off those and get those back in operation. Same thing with remote patient monitoring. A lot of you are going towards that and, and moving into the remote patient monitoring space. Make sure you pick a platform provider that is able to integrate not just with the hardware, but with the, the monitoring devices as well. Now, as you're investigating where you're going with your platform, all the, the bells and whistles, of course, there are going to be things that, that you have to have, right? It has to be a video component. As Michael said, there's uh, you know a chance that they're they're going to stop reimbursing for, for phone calls. So it has to have a video component, but you're also going to want things like secure messaging, uh, obviously making sure it's HIPAA compliant, being able to e-prescribe. A lot of these features will be redundant, hopefully, to what's in your EMR. Uh, we have those in our platform as well, but there is going to be some redundancy. But outside of that EMR, you need to make sure that this is a full spectrum platform. Can it integrate with those clinical devices? Does it give you the ability to have on-call appointments with your providers? Uh, are there things like virtual waiting rooms and mobile triage? Michael's gonna talk about that here in a minute, but the ability for a medical provider to, whether it's at the ER or maybe even in the back of an ambulance, give a heads up to the, the, where they're headed, where the, you know, the, the, the physician that's coming into the situation, they're going to be able to triage that person in the moment virtually and update the provider who will be joining the session uh, in a matter of moments. So you'll see, we, we're going to circle some, some of these attributes that again, should be, or probably will be redundant, but make sure as you all are looking at not just creating a platform, but creating a whole telemedicine department make sure the platform is going to be able to grow with you, expand with you. Again, 
25 to 30 different use cases. You may be doing five or six right now, but you know, what's, what's in store, what's coming down the pike, how can you get ahead of the game and be ready when certain instances happen, not if they happen. So it's important that we're looking full spectrum, full picture when we're talking about telemedicine. Yeah. And, and I'll add to that as well, John. I mean, the, the importance for scalability is, is even more so amplified right now, just because technology is growing at such an exponential rate. I mean, we, we were on a meeting a couple months ago with uh, a platform that uses an iPhone camera to take pulse ox and uh, respirations and things like that. So, I mean, the technology is getting crazy advanced. Uh, so it's now you know, more crucial than ever to make sure you're set up to take advantage of those things uh, if you need to, as they come down the pipe. Uh, but like John said, the, the circled items here and these components we're seeing oftentimes are redundant with the EMR. Um, in our opinion, what you don't want to do is keep them both, right? You don't want to have two places for providers to document. You don't want two patient portals, two places where you're sending messaging. Uh, and that really just uh, highlights the importance of a seamless integration with your native EMR, uh, whether it's Epic, Allscripts, you know, NextGen, Athena, whatever it may be, uh, having a tool that eventually down the line or right now can plug into and play really nicely with your EMR is going to save a lot of headache down the line. And, and some of the reasons for that, uh, the first of which, and, and I think the most important is it's gonna help tremendously with provider adoption. Uh, I'm sure you all probably experienced a, a little bit of pain trying to get providers to adopt EMR um, you know, whenever that did happen. What we don't want to do is to introduce what looks and feels like an entirely new platform and make providers think that that's happening again. And so having it integrated with your EMR system or any other systems that you're using, making it so a provider can just click a button and from the EMR and get into the right visit is gonna help out tremendously with that because there's really not much else to learn at that point point aside from just how to treat a virtual visit and as far as communication with the patient. So provider adoption will be directly influenced positively by integration simply because it's more easy to use for both providers, administrators, as you can see here, as well as patients. Uh, there's also going to be a lot of time savings and of course cost savings uncovered from integrating as well. That way you don't have to schedule appointments two times when someone calls to reschedule or change a time or cancel, there's eliminating duplication there is obviously going to save a whole lot of time. And also when you're talking about the scheduling aspect of things, um, it keeps everything consistent. Uh, and also from a reporting standpoint, it's very helpful to eliminate discrepancies. And so if everything's originating from the EMR and your virtual care platform has a robust reporting engine, which we'll talk about in just a little bit, um, everything will match up and you can kind of use both to their strengths and weaknesses uh, to get the data that you need. Uh, it'll also preserve the revenue cycle, of course, not forcing you to document in a different system that doesn't have your ENM coding rules built into it and things like that, uh, making sure all of that is kept native inside of the EMR and integrating certain components when necessary, of course, is going to help pre preserve the revenue cycle and decrease uh, margin for error as well. Uh, enhanced security, you know, yeah, this is something that is certainly on the list of priorities for a lot of people, but definitely isn't as high as it was before COVID simply because of the waiver from CMS right now. But again, that is being rolled back eventually. And so um, kind of keeping that in the back of your mind, if you might be on a, a FaceTime or a Skype or something like that right now, that's not HIPAA compliant and you don't have a BAA with that company, that's something that integration can also help with enhancing that security as well of maybe a platform that you choose to switch to because EMRs are probably some of the most secure platforms out there. And so if we keep everything originating in the EMR, it's gonna be better from a security standpoint as well as from an authentication standpoint. So not only is this going to make it so we eliminate passwords and logins for the virtual care visit for both patients, providers, admins, uh, but it also helps from a user management standpoint as well. If someone's terminated or quits, um, there's no chance that you'll forget to remove their account in Visual, for example, if you're integrated with the EMR. And of course, we talked about eliminating duplication 
And then lastly, it's just less training required at the end of the day. If all you have to train providers to do is click a button and just teach them how to treat a virtual visit once they're in it, it's much less of a headache than teaching someone a whole entirely new system. So we think integration is very, very important, as I'm sure you can tell a lot of our customers do too, and, and we're, we're big fans of it for sure. So we'd encourage you to keep that uh, high on your priority list as well as you're evaluating a lot of this new innovative technology that's becoming available. And kind of on that note too, one of those areas of innovation is asynchronous care. So pretty much everything that we've talked about so far has been in relation to a synchronous video visit with live audio and video, of course. Uh, but there is asynchronous telemedicine that's gaining a lot of popularity right now as far as allowing a patient to self-assess himself, maybe take a photo of something, send it to a provider where that visit does not end up in a virtual conference. And so in, in an effort to make this a little bit more interactive, um, you guys can text the three letters DTC to that phone number below. And uh, it'll respond with a link and you can actually go pretend that you're a patient on a store and forward example that we've deployed. Uh, so you can kind of see what it looks like. All of the fields are not required, so you can skip them. You don't have to put any of your information in. Um, but I would encourage you, if you do this, uh, click on the skin issue rash button when you get to the chief complaint question, because it'll show you how you can take a photo, send it to a provider and things like that. Now, again, Storm Forward is not necessarily new, uh, but it is definitely being innovated very rapidly right now. And it's gaining, again, a lot of popularity. So if this is something that you're looking at doing eventually, there are some things that we would recommend uh, you keep in mind as you're evaluating different platforms. I think by far the most important thing to keep in mind is the consumer friendliness um, and the ability to brand the site essentially. And so, you know, because a lot of times, probably 95% of the times at least, um, these are patient self submitted. And so there's, there's no one there from the hospital to help them get set up for their asynchronous appointment. They're doing this all alone. So it should be branded. It should be a seamless experience. It should be web-based, no download or registration required just to eliminate as many barriers as possible there. Um, Another component of asynchronous care that you might wanna pay attention to is the ability to route patients based on previous answers, whether that's through artificial intelligence or conditional logic. Uh, for example, on that example that we showed, if you clicked on skin issue, uh, it would ask you to take a picture of your skin issue. Or if you clicked on fever, it would ask you how high. Um, so kind of taking you down different pathways and ultimately disposing you to different points of care. Maybe if I clicked ear pain, I would go to an audiologist. And if I clicked on skin pain, I would notify a dermatologist, right? Um, so again, being able to route patients to the appropriate point of care is very, very important there as well. So again, asynchronous care gaining a lot of popularity right now. Our reimbursement is there for it. We're not sure what it'll do past COVID, but we're confident it will stay because it can um, save a lot of time and increase accessibility to care uh, very, very much. Yeah, now one of the big things uh, a lot of folks have, have told us that they are, are missing with their platform is reporting. Uh, we have found a, a lot of folks really get the, the biggest bang for their buck with reports. This is what I call kind of that Wizard of Oz moment where you're able to pull the curtain back, kind of see what's going on, who's using it, who's, who's pulling the levers here. And, and reporting and, and specifically in-depth reporting is going to really open your eyes to a lot of different areas, specifically utilization uh, scheduling and, and session details. Now, with utilization, you're going to be able to see, run reports on, or you need to be able to run reports on who your super users are, who your late or, or even non adopters are in terms of providers who's using it, who's not. What type of patients are you seeing? Maybe where, where are they coming from? If you're seeing a lot of patients from an area where you don't have a clinic, maybe we do a, a satellite location there, or maybe we look at expanding into that area, but then also uh, specialty. Do we have a lot of folks who are uh, you know, doing their, their diabetes follow-up 
pay, uh, visits via telemedicine. Really get a, a look behind who's using it, how are they using it, where are they using it, and and open your eyes. I've said for a while, if we don't have reports, it's it's essentially like flying the airplane blind, blindfolded. We, we don't see the gauges. We don't see all the instrument panels. We, we really don't know where we've been. We don't know where we're going. Uh, we don't know what speed we're flying at, etc. We have to be able to get detailed reporting in order to know how our system is being utilized and how we need to utilize it going forward. Let's talk about scheduling insights. Uh, you, you may find there are certain times of day or, or certain days of the week where you're seeing more virtual visits and therefore we can set aside some provider hours, kind of like those office hours when you were in college and your professors were available for you to kind of pop in. Maybe we find out, hey, Tuesdays between three and 7 p.m., we're getting our highest usage. So let's make some more providers available during that time than we do on a Wednesday morning, for example. So you're going to be able to get a glimpse of scheduling insights, but then also session details. <clears throat> you're going to be able to look at the, the quality of the video. If you're in a rural area where broadband is, there's not, there's not a lot of broadband uh, uh available. Maybe we, we able to, we're able to kind of downshift and scale back the quality of the video. Not so much that it's, it's poor video and we can't see what's going on, but enough to, to get the session done with still maintaining a, a good enough level of video quality. <clears throat> Maybe we're in a metropolitan area and broadband width is not an issue. We ratchet it up and we're at a, a, a very high broadband, very, very wide broadband uh, width at that point. So scaling the video up or down based on use duration is another one. Uh, maybe you find Dr. John Elder is doing 47 minute appointments. Dr. Michael O'Neill is doing 12 minute appointments. There's not a, a good or bad there. It's not that one is, is doing it right or wrong, but maybe we can ask Dr. Elder to go, Hey, 47 minutes. What do you do in that appointment? Or, Hey, Dr. O'Neill, how are you getting in and out so quickly? You know, is it, is it longer with our patients? More time is better or more appointments in the day is better. Again, neither is right or wrong, but we're able to get a glimpse behind the curtain for session details. Uh, so if you're not able to pull reports, talking about the schedule, the utilization, the session, et cetera, again, it's like flying the plane blindfolded. We don't want to do that. It's not really safe for anybody. We want to make sure we know exactly how we're using this, this platform so that you can best utilize it going forward. Uh, to Michael's point, I don't think telemedicine is going away. I think there's all, it's always going to be a, a, a part of the, the, the woven into the fabric of our society going forward. So we really need to know how are we utilizing it? Who's utilizing it? Uh, you know, how can we hold patients accountable? If a patient says, hey, I wasn't in that session, does the report show? Yeah, actually, you logged in and logged out. The provider was there, and so were you. We have record of it, so, record of it, so the charge stands. We really need to get creative and, and get granular with what we're looking at and how we're viewing and utilizing reports going forward. Yeah, and, and I would even add there, John, um, that it's really more crucial than ever right now, um, simply because there's there's a lot of uncertainty um, in healthcare as far as what's going to happen, right? What what happens if we go on lockdown again? Uh, what happens if you know this vaccine works wonders and COVID goes away completely? Let's hope that's the case, but we we just don't know, of course, right? And so keeping all of this information at your fingertips and readily available so you can see what your visit volume is doing is not only going to help you in the moment to see how people are using it, but it's also going to help you plan for the future and see what the trends are. Are they going up or down and, and kind of allow you to better predict what next year and the year to come's volumes are going to be uh, to help you invest a proper amount into your programs here. And so, again, we think this is a very, very crucial component of any virtual care platform. And uh, in our opinion, it's one that should be at the top of your list. So, so far, this has been a lot of information, right? And, and I, I really hope it's been helpful so far. Uh, but if you haven't taken anything yet, and this has just been an overwhelming data dump for you, um, pay attention to this slide here. We've, we've taken seven or so really strong keys to a successful virtual care program, not just today, but also innovating it for the future. And um, we're pretty confident if you do a handful of these, you'll, you'll be doing just fine. Um, the first one is um, having technology that facilitates enablement 
of an existing provider network uh, rather than a competing platform that might force you to bring or use someone else's providers. Uh, those scenarios work in some cases, um, but we're seeing a lot of uh, kind of switch from that legacy style of using an exist or, um, external provider network. And we're seeing a very, very strong migration towards why don't we just partner with hospitals in our area? This hospital has neurologists, this hospital has neonatologists, they're underutilized at the moment, they have extra bandwidth. It's really a win-win at that point. Continuity of care stays intact much better. You have much better insight into how the sessions are being performed, what's actually happening, the documentation behind them. And then ultimately you're keeping things local and you have much more control over who is actually taking care of your patient. So if possible, um, you know, pick some technology that's gonna focus on enablement rather than competitiveness. And of course, pick something that's secure. We, we've hit on that a little bit so far, uh, but I would also encourage you to explore options that are independent of your EMR. Uh, a lot of the EMR systems out there right now, like Epic, Allscripts, Athena, um, are coming out with video platforms inside of their EMR. Um, those are good for right now, right? And, and we, we honestly think that's good because it's helping people get into virtual care for a very low cost, sometimes even free from some of the EMRs. Uh, but one thing that we really need to keep in mind here is that those are video platforms, not telemedicine platforms, and EMR vendors are not telemedicine vendors. And so when you get to a point when you need to expand into these 25 or 30 other areas of virtual care, you need a platform that's gonna scale with you and allow you to do that. And you know, simply at the end of the day, telemedicine components is not what's paying the EMR bills. And so it's gonna be lower on a priority list, just the same with a telemedicine company is not an EMR. So, you know, we're not focused on building EMR tools out. So really this brings me to focusing on interoperability. And I think if you can find a system that is independent of your EMR, but able to integrate very nicely with it to where you can create the same experience, that is the ideal scenario because now you have two companies working for you. Um, one of them is focused 100% on supporting your EMR. One of them is focused 100% on supporting your telemedicine platform, but the experience is no different as if it were the other way around. So, and interoperability with other core systems outside of your EMR is something to keep in mind too. We don't necessarily think this is a requirement by any means, um, but having the ability to integrate like a PACS or a risk imaging system or maybe a revenue cycle system or a patient queue tracking system, whatever it may be down the line will be very, very helpful and save you some headache if you just go with a tool that can do that and maybe you just don't do it from day one, but when you're ready, it can facilitate it. So that's another thing to keep in mind there is just how friendly is the interoperability of the technology that you're exploring. Uh, we're big fans, and a lot of our customers are finding this as well, of device agnostic approaches that are putting the consumer first and keeping them in mind. Uh, because right now, about 85% of patients are coming into at least our visits on mobile devices. And so whether that's all the way down to an iPhone 4S, for example, which I think is 11 or 12 years old, all the way up to a new iPhone 10 or 12 now, I, I guess, um, the point is that should not be the barrier to the patient from having one of their visits. So um, that's a really important consideration to keep in mind is a platform or an additional supplemental technology piece that can be ran on any device, preferably without a download. So you don't have to deal with storage and people forgetting passwords that ultimately is putting your patients and your providers first. And we, we feel it should also be branded as well. Um, and, and even more so branded than putting a logo and a color scheme on a website, uh, but more along the lines of a full branded portal from notifications to your web domain, really to make your patients feel comfortable that they are seeing your providers, not someone else's. Uh, so like me as Michael O'Neill, if, if I get an email notification from Visuel for my appointment with Erlanger Health, I'm not clicking that because I don't know who Visuel is and I'm not discussing my healthcare with them, right? So branding is a really crucial component as well. It's just simply being able to customize the solution easily. Uh, it is no secret 
that pretty much all hospitals are different. We've definitely found that out in our work that rural hospitals are very different than metropolitan hospitals. They have different patient populations. The same with academic medical centers compared to safety net hospitals and children's hospitals, you name it. And even geography plays a role in that too. Some areas are going to need access to interpreter services built into the solution while others might not be in that diverse of an area. And so the point I'm getting at here is that it is nearly impossible to build as a technology company, one platform that suits everybody. And so picking a solution and exploring solutions, keep in mind and, and place a priority on how customizable is this? How configurable is it? And what is the process to doing this? Because me as hospital A might wanna do telestroke different than hospital B does telestroke. And is that going to incur a lot of development costs and timeline, or is it just switches and toggles that can be configured very easily? So everyone's different and we believe that everyone should be able to have their own platform that works best for them as a result, because if not, patients suffer, providers suffer, and it's just a poor experience. Another really great piece of advice is to really place an emphasis on establishing program ownership, um, preferably within an independent department. Um, so, you know, having a staff of two, three, maybe four, even if they're part time uh, managers to help with the facilitation of the telemedicine system is very, very beneficial because that is all they're focused on, right? Uh, we're seeing people that create these departments reallocate um, staff members to be in charge of certain initiatives and things along those lines are really, really contributing to the success of telemedicine programs as a whole, as opposed to say, just keeping it with IT, who of course is managing, you know, 58 other systems, right? So if that's possible for you, uh, we would strongly recommend that as well, because we've seen that really, really work wonders to be frank. And I think lastly here, um, like we touched on, a solution that's gonna scale with you. What you don't wanna do is invest in a platform, you know, in March of next year, for example, and then 2022 rolls around, and you want to do a different type of virtual care, integrate a new monitoring device, and you've now figured out that you've outgrown the platform that you used for the past year. Not only is that not cost effective, but it's also frustrating to the end users when platforms are switching and experiences are switching too frequently. So um, we believe it's best to grow into a solution and at that rate, pick a partner that keeps that cost in mind. Of course, cost inherently is going to increase with use, uh, but pick someone who understands that and, and takes into account that right now, there is a lot of uncertainty as far as what's going to happen with visit counts and uh, pick someone that's friendly in that sense as well. And then lastly here, we'll, we'll touch on just a kind of a simple roadmap, if you will. Um, that a lot of our customers have followed and used to uh, build out many you know, successful telemedicine use cases. We have some customers that are doing 17 to 18 just in that one health system. And so it really all starts with a plan, of course. And I know that seems obvious, but really sit down at the beginning of a quarter, at the end of a previous year, whatever it may be, and say, what do we want to do next year? What do we want to do next quarter? Do we want to deploy school-based? Do we want to offer on-demand urgent care? What are the four, five, six different new lines of care that we want to deploy? And what's our strategy for deploying those? Um, do we need to plan to evaluate any new equipment or any new technology? Are there any new integration components that are going to be required? Do we have an, enough licenses to give to some providers that are going to be on call, what does the scheduling look like? Once you've figured all those components out, really focus on establishing that program leadership. Uh, give this project to someone and let that be their baby. And maybe you give them two or three and they can all kind of collaborate together because they're similar in workflows. Uh, but this, in our opinion, is very, very important uh, to have someone really own a project when it comes to virtual care. And of course, budget planning. Um, some you know, things to keep in mind here, equipment. Uh, do you need to increase bandwidth? Do you need to purchase any clinical devices for any of your new initiatives? Again, do you need to purchase any additional licenses? Is your platform that you're using today going to accommodate the use cases that you wanna do next year, for example? If not, is it a matter of asking that vendor to help you develop those tools? If so, what's that gonna cost? If they say, no, we're not gonna do that, it doesn't line up with our vision, 
then it's time to look for a platform that will support that. And so what's that gonna cost? So really, really doing your due diligence here will be very helpful. Uh, and speaking from experience, being very detailed and being very transparent and intentional with the information that you share with the vendors that you're looking at is very helpful to creating pricing as well and making sure that there's no surprises or increases down the line. And once that's done, it's, it's time to deploy and promote. So deployment obviously is a collaboration between the technology vendor that you're using and your internal team that's training providers and rolling things out. Promotion is another aspect that we encourage everyone to focus on. Uh, press releases are a great way to do this. Uh, news outlets right now are very friendly to the idea of having interviews and things like that with people that are innovative in virtual care. And so work towards that stuff and get the word out and uh, deploy your system and, and let it run smoothly. And then I think it's very important to keep in mind that even if it's running well and smoothly, it might not be running perfect. And this kind of goes back to the ability to easily customize your solution um, without having to engineer a whole new product or custom develop anything. Because if you figure out one day, you know, based on a survey that a patient has submitted that your workflow could be improved somehow, you need to make sure that's easy to do and it's not going to take three months and several thousand dollars to custom develop uh, what that workflow will look like. And so always keep in mind and always uh, schedule uh, different uh, intervals as far as reevaluating all of your workflows, uh, looking at survey data and things like that that patients have submitted and see where you can improve. And then from there, it's really rinse and repeat. Um, those four, five, six, whatever initiatives that were just deployed throughout this roadmap are now running smoothly. We're gonna look at them next year and, and see if any re-engineering is necessary but let's start over. Let's pick four, five, six more for the following year and really see where we can start expanding the utilization of virtual care to um, not only increase ROI, save costs, it's obviously very great from a financial standpoint, but at the end of the day, it really increases access to care. It helps patients, the more types of telemedicine that you're offering, the broader audience and the broader population that you can serve and the more people that you can help. And so, uh, with that, thank you so much. It's, it's been a pleasure speaking with you today. I'm going to open the floor up for questions here in, in just a moment, uh, but I'll toss this on the screen here. Just in case you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to John or myself. We are happy to help and are uh, you know, very responsive and, and can get you taken care of if you need anything. We also have a lot of free information on our website that you can download or just go read articles around reimbursement, funding opportunities, and, and legislation updates. So there's that link there. Um, and one thing I haven't touched on yet is we actually have a partner that, believe it or not, provides free grant assistance. So if you guys are you know, thinking about applying for a DLT grant or some FCC funding, uh, shoot John or myself an email, and we are happy to get you introduced to them. And they are um, more than happy to help provide some insight there as well. So again, thank you guys so much. It's been a pleasure and uh, looking forward to answering some questions. Thank you so much, Michael and John. That's, that's a wealth of information that you guys shared. Um, just a couple of questions that I have, and I'm op opening it up now. Uh, for those of you that have joined us today, please use the Q&A function to ask questions. Um, that way we've got your contact information if we need to do some research before answering your question. Um, so you mentioned on the DLT grants um, and I was speaking with someone just the other day. Um, my experience with writing a DLT grant was several years ago. So I was curious, um, have the objective scoring changed recently? I'm not sure if it's changed recently and if so, by how much, um, but I do know, you know, with any advice that I can give with the DLT grants is really, really be on your P's and Q's with it because it is very, very detailed. And even after you get the award, uh, it's really not a done deal yet. You really need to make sure you're responsive on the paperwork and very detailed in what you're submitting. And even before that as well, when you're doing your due diligence and reaching out to vendors and writing the application, make sure you're doing a very detailed job of that because I've heard that the process is um, extensive to apply for switches and changes. For example, if you switch a vendor or say, well, I wanna use a different device now, well, that could change the scope of the grant. So you really need to make sure that you're doing all of that beforehand. 
and then um, and then you likely will avoid those headaches. But um, that is a good question about the scoring criteria. So I will get that to our um, legislative team and let them look into it. And we'll probably post a blog post or something about that. That sounds great. Um, and then the other question or statement that you know I wanted to share with those that have um, joined us or might be watching the recording later is um, the, one of the beauties of the DLT grant is that it is for equipment only. It is not for um, paying salaries or administrative costs. It is for the equipment. So it really helps um, when you have large equipment costs that you're trying to figure out how to cover. Now, the best of my knowledge, there's still a match. So you have to work that in as well. So that's a card cash match. Uh, it's not uh, in kind. And then the other thing, I can't remember how long, are they typically a one year project year when you submit the DLTs? Um, we've been um, working with some people who have gotten three, I believe it's. Okay. Yeah, I just, I couldn't remember. They, the, it's available every year. Right. Um, to right. receive, right. Yeah. to or apply mm -hmm. for the grant. Right, you get the funding, I think one year at a time, but I think it lasts for, for three years. Okay. Um, and then you also mentioned um, school-based telehealth projects, and that's an area that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, under, since we operate um, under the umbrella of the Indiana Rural Health Association, we had uh, a grant that is now sunset uh, for specifically for school programs and purchasing equipment, placing them in schools and making those connections. Um, for if someone wants to start a school-based program, what is your your number one? Remember to do this for them. Oh man, um, I would say remember to make it very easy to use on the school nurses um, because obviously those are the people there with the patient and they have the devices in hand. Um, the horoscopes right here that we showed on, on one of the pictures, um, these are a little expensive and it gets a little cost prohibitive if you're deploying out to like 40 or 50 schools, unless you have a grant, right? If this is funding out of pocket, um, remember to do your due diligence on the types of devices and get some opinions from some of the school nurses and also from some of the providers who are going to be participating in the visits. So you can kind of get both ends of the spectrum here. Um, you get feedback from the nurses that say, this is really hard to use. It's very hard to find a picture of the eardrum. I'm having to look at the screen and it's not natural. And then you also get feedback from the providers that say, you know, even when they do get a, a photo of the eardrum, it's blurry and, and I, can't, I can't make a diagnosis off of this. So before you write the devices into your grant, I would say remember to get that done. The technology side, like on a platform basis, is pretty simple. I mean, it's, it can be on demand, it can be scheduled. That stuff really doesn't change too much. You can really make that as easy as you want to, just clicking a link and getting in front of a provider. Uh, really, the devices is where you have the most potential to, um, I don't want to say fail, but, but expose inefficiencies, if I will. Um, and again, it's tricky to get those types of devices and numbers switched around on those DLT grants. And so if you are applying for one of those, definitely make sure you do diligence uh, before doing that. And then even if you're not and it's coming out of pocket, um, get the feedback that you need. That way you can kind of do an analysis yourself and say, okay, a firefly is, you know, four times cheaper than a horoscope, but none of the visits are going to work. So is it really worth it to, you know, pay $300 versus $1,300, right? right. Um, so anyways, I think that would be my best advice. If you're starting a school-based program, really do due diligence on the devices and get a lot of feedback from the people who are going to be using them because that can never hurt. Very cool. All right, I am not seeing any questions from the audience. Um, so I wanted to go ahead and I'm in the chat, I'm going to put in a survey. Uh, because we are federally funded, we do ask that um, folks participate in surveys from time to time when they take advantage of our services. And that helps us when we report back to our funder of how we've been using our funds. So I'm going to click this link to, and it's just a two minute survey. 
And any other last minute thoughts or questions, things we need to address? All right, hearing none. Uh, thank you again for joining us. Um, uh, such a wealth of knowledge. I appreciate your time and, and all of the information. Thank you all so much. Thank for you guys. Us. Thank you for all what right. you do. And uh, we look forward to learning how we can help. All right. Have Thanks a good weekend. Again. All right. Y'all too. Bye. Bye-bye.